What is up, my man? How are you, man? I'm so so happy to be here by you to speak with you, Tom. How's everything going? I'm good. We should we should uh, since we didn't st- you know you, this is the first time we're doing a double header because uh-huh. uh, the I'm I only can shoot twice a, a week and I wanted to make sure we got you in before your primary. Yes, sir. Um, so we should start with a uh, hello, nerds. Hello, nerds. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I actually well, love that. I actually love that because I say that sometimes randomly, so that's so funny to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, let's get started with a little bit of background about um, who you are and your, you know, your your journey to this point, uh, just so the audience can get to know Barrington, the guy, before we get into Barrington, the congressional candidate. Yes, sir, and I appreciate that. Um, my name is Barrington Martin II. I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. I've been in Atlanta all my life, except for one year when I went to school my freshman year in college and played college basketball there. A little fun fact: um, I got my bachelor's at Georgia State in political science. Um, I'm currently a special needs educator at McNair Discovery Learning Academy. Um, My entire working career, um, I was paralegal. That's where the law comes into place. So I've always had an interest in the law. So growing up, I'm thinking that I was going to go to law school. That's why I was a paralegal. And I realized I didn't want to go to law school anymore. So then um, I got to grad school in which I'm still enrolled, but I'm taking a break because I'm running for Congress, of course. And then I decided that I, I thought I wanted to be a law professor. And then I was like, no, 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 I don't want to be a law professor. So then I asked myself, what, what could I do with my life, with the things that I love, with the law, that I can make a difference? And then boom, I thought about it. Why don't I create the laws? And so then it's been um, a lot of events to take place through my life that got me to this point. And here we are now in 2020. I'm running for Congress against the legendary icon, John Lewis. Yeah. Seriously, dude, you don't. What a way to start a congressional career. I mean, he's kind of like you know. I'm sure there are already statues of John Lewis, and I'm guessing there will be more in the murals, decades murals, to come. Murals and street names. Murals, no, it's going to be yeah. statues most likely, but it's murals and uh, street names right now. So you know, who in their right mind runs against a legend? Um, the person that, <laughs> that thinks that they can win and knows that they can win. That's who does that. The person who who isn't afraid um, to put those heavy loads on his back and, you know, carry the torch further than it's ever been before, because it's not I'm not running against John Lewis. I'm running for District 5 and I'm running for Atlanta. And essentially I'm running for the whole nation. And he, also it's even bigger than that. I'm running for millennials because I feel that. It's our nation now. When you look at the stats, when you look at the median age of the United States of America, you look at the median age of Congress and the Senate, it's a disparity there. So, you know, it's about time for for us to get together, um, you know, put on our work boots, put on our work gloves and go to work because it's our nation now. And we deserve to inherit the nation we choose to the way we choose to. Excuse me. And so once again, much love, respect and adoration. Or Congressman Lewis, I would never, never, ever, ever disrespect him in any way or talk less of him because he's an ancestor. He's important to the very fragments of this nation and this nation. He's paid a debt that this nation can never repay. But he's old right now. He has stage four cancer and it's hard for him to fight the good fight as the way he could have in the past. So someone has to carry those loads. I want to put my name in, in the hat to do that. Nobody else has done it because I feel like everybody else is afraid and I've never been afraid. So I'm guessing, Barrington, that uh, there have been people who've come to you and they say, you know, Barrington, you're a bright guy. You got a great future ahead of you. You know, John is probably not going to run again after this term. You know, just wait your t- wait your turn, you know. Uh, and wh- how do you, how do you respond to that? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you tell someone that, no, I, now is the time and I have to do it now? Well, first of all, I, you have to look at the constitution. You have to be 25 years old. You have to live in the state and you have to be a citizen of the United States for seven years. So there's no such thing in, in that regard. Um, there is no such thing as wait. And then when you've been in the district and you lived in the district all your life, like I have, and you've seen the changes and you've seen the, the, the places where things need to be changed, there is no need to wait when that, when, when that, in those regards, excuse me. And just, um, 
why I don't understand the notion or the thought process that someone has to rate their turn. There's no such thing as your turn in this world. I think that society has shown us that there's no such thing as a turn because if you just sit by and wait, life will pass you by and opportunity will pass you by. And we live in a world and we live in a society where opportunity is not as equitable as it should be. And so in instances like this, my actions, um, in my opinion, show the way that my generation needs to be when it comes to opportunity that we don't we can't wait any longer because there are problems on the horizon and that it's, it's, it's dire that we make the necessary changes so that we don't even have to go through those issues. And so that's really what I tell people um, who ask who always say that, oh, you can wait your turn or why didn't you small start at a smaller office because we don't have that much time anymore. And there are problems on the horizon that we are not prepared for and that, quite frankly, our leaders aren't getting us ready for either. So someone has to do the work and I don't mind doing the work at all. Well, Nell, uh, Nell says that he watched you on Paget's show last night and that he says you're the real deal, uh, young and super smart. So you, you're you you're getting some converts already. I appreciate that, Nell. Thank you so much. Man. I, I, I'm grateful, man. I'm just I'm just trying to do the, do the work that's, that's ahead of me. That's all. I promise. <laughs> and Barrington, what is your what is your website address for people that want to learn more and if they want to kind of support your campaign? Oh, vote, the dream. vote the dream. Vote the dream. Um, I'll speak about why why I named it that. Um, honestly, I have two websites. Uh, titles. One is Barrington versus Congress and the other is Vote the Dream. And I think it just shows um, two aspects of my political ideology, so to speak. Um, I feel that we have to, well, I named it Barrington versus Congress because I feel that we have to hold Congress accountable right now. In my opinion, um, with everything that's going on, there have not been the Congress that America has needed. And then you have Vote the Dream and we can get into that a little bit later, Tom. Oh, dude, no, I got to get into that now. That sounds intriguing. What the heck is Vote the Dream? Okay, so um, Vote the Dream was an idea I adapted from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, you know, that um, him and I share the same birthplace in Atlanta, Georgia, and I feel that it was only right in me running uh, for the district that I um, encompass him within my my policies and my, the foundation of um, my ideology. And so basically, it's taking um social social justice and combining the economic part of it as well as far as when Dr. King um wanted to establish the poor people's movement and the economic bill of rights so i feel that we're um in, in embarking on a political renaissance right now where we know that something is wrong on a mass scale on all levels um where there is finances economics and society um the way that we deal with each other as human beings we know there's a problem and now I feel like the people are waking up and the people are now um, holding the government accountable. So I said, we're going to vote the dream. We're going to make um, basic, the basic ideologies of Dr. King's dream come true through my political platform. And that is um, through um, a people's bailout, something I entitled two policies between UBI and universal health care. And I feel that these two policies combined create or allow the American people to access that equitable, the equitable part of the piece of pie that the corporations have been hogging all this time. It gives people the independence, it gives the people the freedom to take agencies over their own lives and not have to worry about their situations dictating their choices in life. I hope I just wow. that. I hope I just yeah. that. Okay. No, that's good stuff. Let's take a little, let's take a little look at the Vote the Dream website here. Yes, sir. Let's see. So uh, we'll go start from the beginning. Kudos to whoever is uh, your art director, or web or photographer. <laughs> yes, that's my that's my brother Michael Dawkins. Shout out to him. He does Michael all Dawkins. Work. Yes, he, he he ain't playing, man. This looks really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now let's go to the platform. So okay. you're, oh, you're you're actually pretty- actually Tom, don't mean to cut you off. Go back and scroll down. Go back and scroll down. All scroll right, down. I shall. Scroll all the way down. You guys sign up if you're watching this. That's just my bio. Don't worry about that. We'll get to that later. I just said that already. That's me as a baby. Right here. Boom. Here we go. Uh-huh. So read that. I want you to read that paragraph. I don't wanna I don't want us to get hound into it, but basically, um, it's um a greater perspective of what I was just mentioning, you know. Um Right, right now we're in a political renaissance. 
You know, we can change the very fabrics of our nation from here on out in a very big way. I feel like it. It's just that, you know, we have to do it's in, in alliance or in addition, excuse me, to holding the government accountable. We have to hold ourselves accountable and we have to do our due diligence and get out there and not only vote, but, you know, look at the little in, injustices and the little inequities within our communities and speak out upon those as well. Because what we fail to realize at the time is that it's always the small things that lead to bigger incidences. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, this is what Vote the Dream is about, essentially. Well, let me, uh, some people could say, hey, y- yes, uh, this has a lot of DNA from Martin Luther King and there's, there's uh, high kind of aspirations here. And if there's anyone that has a connection to the, the civil rights movement and that, that kind of tumultuous period in our country's history, uh, John Lewis would be one of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, yeah. So what's, wh- why can't he do, help us with this stuff? Why do we need uh, Barrington Martin the, the second? Because I, I honestly feel like he's he's done his part, and it's kind of, in my opinion, um, it's not it's not fair to him for us as a people to continue to hold him accountable as to be responsible for our progressive movement towards an even better future than the future that he has allowed for us to live right now. Because quite frankly, Tom, if it weren't for John Lewis, I wouldn't be speaking to you today. I wouldn't be able to run for Congress right now. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be able to, you know, be alongside him along the ballot. So that's why I hold um, extreme adoration and reverence for him as the person he is in history, but just as a human being from off top, you know. Um, but um we can't take away the fact that, you know, he has a job, he has an oath that he has to fulfill. It just so happens that, you know, he's going through a personal thing right now with his cancer diagnosis, but not to mention he's 80 years old. He's been in the seat for 33 years. We've mm. been having one driver on one course for 33 years, and we're trying to get to a specific place. Maybe it's time to go through a different route, and maybe we'll get to that destination more quicker than we did or we have before. You know, it's just a different way of um, changing the guards. It's just a different way of, um, you know, fighting the fight that we've been fighting. But at this juncture, in my opinion, it's no longer time to fight anymore. I don't want to fight anymore. You know, it's time to tell these truths and it's time to do the necessary things that we all need to do in order to build that America or to build those communities that we want to build. All right. Well, let's see what if you got in there, what your platform would be and what you'd be uh, focusing on in uh, in that wonderful district of Columbia. You've got no, no, UBI. District, district, five, district five in Atlanta. District five in Atlanta. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Representing <laughs> District five in Atlanta. But you would spend some time in D.C. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. As a congressman. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, Thanks. District five all the way, brother. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So there's a lot of great policies here. Are there certain ones that you feel uh, are particularly relevant to to that District 5? Where, where do you think you can have the most impact on, on your constituents? Well, um, the first three, of course, um, though, um, the primary two, of course, out of those three, universal guaranteed income, universal health care, because it, I think that um, beyond the policy, beyond all the X's and O's and all the numbers, I feel that mm-hmm. we need to come um, within a social agreement with the, within each other and state that there's so much abundance within our nation that at the very minimum, at the very minimum, we all have to. We deserve the basics, you know. We do like, I, and I think that a great qual- a quantifier of that is the minimum wage line, which is almost, I think, thirteen thousand dollars. So I feel that with universal guaranteed income, we can all come to an agreement and say, hey, at the very minimum, no one should should be living at the poverty line, and we can give. We're gonna we're gonna work and ensure to make sure that we can um, give each other that, and that's where universal guaranteed income comes in. But on the back end, we need to have universal health care because Healthcare should not be tied to employment. The, well, the general, as we've seen right now with this coronavirus situation, the general welfare of the people matters most because the people um, create the economy. It's not the other way around. The economy doesn't make this nation, the mm-hmm. people make the nation. And with those two um, primary policies through the people's bailout, as I co- coined it, it creates trickle up economics. And now, what you will see is the playing field will start to level out. And then, of course, when those two things happen, I have to I want to make sure that I give people back the democracy, people back their power 
within the government through the power of choice. You got democracy dollars. I think um, ranked choice voters is very important. Um, term limits, um, four term limits. I feel that um, essentially at the very at the very max, it will only take me five terms to do everything that I need to do. And I can leave my district and I can leave the country off better than I did before in that position that I was in. So tell me a little bit, of, a little bit, Barrington, about um, why you think, uh, why you decided to make this move um, when it is, it is a lower probability. Like it's, it's not a, a slam dunk that you'll get there, given the uh, the primary opponent. And you know, like what 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 what's sort of what's the game plan? Like, how do you think this is going to pan out, and you're going to surprise everybody? Tom, I'm going to be honest with you. That's why I laughed when you said that. Not as a sight to you, because I hear this all day, every day, and I'm used mm-hmm. to it. And I love hearing it honestly, but I don't expect to lose in June. And the reason I don't expect to lose in June is because I have faith in the people. And I know that if the people take care of me this very one time, I'm asking them to, I can take care of them the rest of the time. Because we don't have time to wait anymore. Like, it should show by the gumption of me wanting to do this to show how sure I am and how optimistic, but more certainly how confident I am that we can actually change and make a substantial change to change our nation for the better. And that's why I did that. That's why I feel that. And I'm so appreciative and I'm so grateful that you have me here on your platform because I feel that I haven't gotten the chance up to this point. And I feel that my message is so strong that like it will gather everyone from every phase of the um, political spectrum. For example, my team is composed of majority Yang game people and put it like this, the inner circle of my team, my, my, my strategists, my, my managers are composed of a Bernie bro and Yang gang people. And they work together and they still have their beefs about specific ideologies they may not agree with, but we work together. And the point is, is that I'm able to bring people of all walks of life together and we can make something happen. We can make something shape. And I just need the notoriety. I just need the visibility, honestly. That's all I need. If I need, if I, I got the message, I just need people to talk about me. And once people do, I think the entire movement, this entire um, platform will take off. All right. Well, let's, let's spend a little time to get to know Barrington better. Uh, <laughs> let's say you, you get in there and um, you're in D.C. You know, a lot of people say, well... Um, that place, it just, uh, chews up like, like it's a, it's a place where good ideas go to die, blah, blah, blah. And everybody gets sucked into the, to the swamp. Right. Right. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, how could you convince folks that no, uh, I, I, you're going to find a way to really go against the current and and really make change happen because you know you'll be there for a couple of years and you're gonna have to run for re-election like dc you know government is uh not known for being agile uh what how, how do you convince people that like we should give take a shot on this guy well i mean let's look at the basics um the basic dynamics what i mean by that is the aesthetic the median age of congress is near 60 years old it's even higher for senate Tom, I'm 32 years old, vibrant, athletic, in shape, young, not docile. Understand, I'm, I, I come from the common people. I know I have experience, and that's, that's crazy to say, right? Because at first, people know you're young, you don't have experience, but I have experience with the people who need the most help in America and not um, what our leaders feel that, you know, and not the people our, our leaders, you know, um, deal with the most. I mean, not deal with, but cater to. Our leaders don't cater to the people that need help the most. I have experience with those people. You put me in Congress, I hold everybody accountable. It's not a game because I understand how severe it is. I have skin in the game. Like, I'm not looking for a payday. Money doesn't move me. The fact the happiness of my family moves me. The the success, the the joy, the, the, the feeling you get in seeing the people that you care about successful in their own paths, that's what that's what makes me go. And so I want everyone in America to feel that way. Can you honestly say that your representative like feels the same way about you in that way? If you if you have to think about that, that you shouldn't they shouldn't be representing you. It's really that simple. 
Mm -hmm. just need more compassion. We just need more empathy within those leadership positions and we don't have it. It's all a money game. It's all of how can I, how can I kind of sort of, you know, make my legacy better or make my, my pockets bigger, but at the expense of others are not too much. That's how I feel like our leaders are sometimes instead of just like, yo, what can I do to make it to where everybody in my district is going to be successful? And on and on top of that, we're going to move the needle towards a better future because this I have this one area together. Now I can persuade all the other areas to get together. It's so simple. Empathy and compassion. I have that. I care. Tell me an example of in your past where you've been able to use that empathy and compassion to to kind of, you know, have impact? Um, I think, for example, I'm a special needs educator um, for fifth grade. And oftentimes it hurts my heart actually being, actually being in the, um, in the education system and seeing it at face value, you, you understand um, more things than you've understood before. I remember I used to give uh, teachers a lot of slack because I felt like they didn't care. But then once you get inside the system, you start understanding like how it is and you're starting to see what really the problems are. For example, you get a lot of kids in the inner city in um, low income areas and they get labels attached to them like special needs when essentially they're not special needs kids. Um, they just lack the discipline they need to, you know, or the structure they need to be successful, but nothing's really wrong with them. They just don't have, you know, the access to the things that kids in other higher income areas have. And what happens is a lot of times is that their labels are slapped on them and it's not fair because we tend to think that because a kid, a kid, a kid, a kid is a kid, a kid doesn't possess an ego or they're not able to self-actualize the way an adult can, but it's not like that at all. When kids kids understand that when they're in a special needs class, they don't like that because they know they're separated and they're different from the rest of their peers. But nothing is wrong with them. Like there's they're not, you know, they're not special needs, like truly special needs, as they say. They just come from a background of poverty and they don't have access and they don't have the structure. And, and, and what happens is you automatically push them on a route where they have to take all these negative titles. And then what happens is they end up being institutionalized later on. But I come into play and I'm like, hey, no, like I can empathize with you on a point to I get how you're feeling. But what we're going to do is we're going to I'm going to get you right as quick as I can in whatever subject I need to get you right in to, to take those labels away from you or at least to tell to tell you that if you do the work, you can remove those labels from yourself because it's not fair. You didn't you weren't born. You didn't get a chance to be be to choose what situation you were born in. And it's, it's not cool, you know, how that happens in those school systems. But just by having compassion and empathy for those children, you're able to remove the mindset of the labels that have been attached to them. And so that's a direct indicator that shows how just instilling those two ideologies and just by just caring, and essentially, you can make a positive change for people. What do you, you know, the, the special education experience uh, and just being a, a teacher, I, can't, I would be remiss if I didn't get your opinion on what do you think we as a country can do to really change and improve the state of education for our kids? Because, I mean, if you compare us to other countries, we, we spend a significant amount of resources per pupil. Um, and yet it seems like we're not getting the kind of results and uh, kind of impact that, that we all hope for. And, you know, as a, as a supporter of Yang, I, one of the things I like about UBI was that, well, it put kind of power into the hands of the families. Right. And I'm curious, like, you know, we'll touch it on a controversial thing. Like, you know, what do you think about school choice? Like, do you think that, uh, or how do we solve this? If it's not, like, what are some big ideas to make education better in America? Okay. So one, you said one thing that stuck out to me is that we put, we allocate a lot of resources for education and you're absolutely right. But guess what? The, those resources aren't be, um, being allocated properly and dispersed in an equitable fashion. For example, um, the, like I work in the Cab County schools. Some schools um, are in Atlanta. Some schools aren't. But what you, what I notice is, and I noticed a time when I was deciphering what um, if I wanted to teach or not. When I was like actually a substitute teacher, what you'll notice is 
This the Cab County is basically a north south. It's not an east west type of um, county. It's the land. It's divided north south like like that or whatever. And the the more north you get, the you know you get to more money. And you know this by what the children have access to at schools. For example, you have high schools in North DeKalb County with swimming pools with things of that nature, right? I went to a South mm-hmm. DeKalb County school in Cedar Grove High School. I never even knew until I substituted. Um, as an adult, that there were schools with like like swimming pools, and so mm-hmm. the money is the money isn't being um, you know split equally and equitably, and that's that's one of the things why, as you said, um, UBI would, would be benefited. But personally, I think that um, I don't really, I I really, really, really dislike how much the government has a say in in education because of this, and I think that. Um, more resources has to have to be allocated towards the schools. Um, I think that um, it would be more essential for things to like for trade schools to come back and things like that. So, so anyone, so because college isn't for everybody, and I think that we have to start being honest uh, when it start when it comes to education and things of that nature. And I, I don't think we've had the necessary or the proper conversations when it came to education because essentially. Everyone is different, and instead of there being, there needs to be a like a certain standard, but it has to be, it has to be geared towards the person that's learning these things. If that makes sense, if that makes sense, what I'm mm-hmm. saying, you no. Know? And um, I just think we have to be better in um, creating um, individuals or allowing education to allow us to to be honest about history, to be um, you know. To be to gather the, the necessary things and arithmetic that needs to be gathered with, and especially in um, emoting and reading and writing, there should be a base standard, but it needs to be geared towards so it can um, actually help the person that is trying to help the best. Let me share uh, a chart since this is the Nerds for Humanity channel. There, ha- uh, it's like a requirement; we have to have at least one chart <laughs> for a conversation. <laughs> no, no, I love it. I love the stats. Yeah. So, so here is the spending per pupil uh, for OECD countries, and it's adjusted for purchasing power. And what you see is that the U.S. actually spends like quite a bit more Absolutely. than like Sweden, than Germany, than you know Austria. And uh, I think your argument is that uh, it's not that we as a country aren't spending the money. You're saying that it's all going to sort of the two Americas kind of thing. Like Absolutely. It's not, it's right? not going to the, the bottom half. It's not going to yeah. the working class or the lower class. And it's honestly not going to, into some um, middle income communities either. And mm-hmm. a lot of these communities have been fighting for it. And it's, it's sad that their, ver- their voice, excuse me, hasn't been heard. And that's what I'm here for. I'm here, yeah. I'm here to make sure. I'm here to make sure everybody wins, and there is enough where everybody wins. We just have to start believing it, and then once we believe it, we have to make our government believe it. Let me play devil's advocate with you for a second. Um, I'm sure there are some libertarians out there who would say, "You know what? If, if we really want to help out um, these middle class and and working class folks who can't send their kids to these fancy." private schools or they're not in a public school district with like the pools and the polo team and whatever. (laughs) Um, That let's just give these, these folks uh, a voucher and have a competitive market system where, you know, uh, they can send their kids wherever they want. Uh, Maybe not the most expensive private school, but you know, there's other places or charter schools, things like that. I was curious, what's your opinion on on education reform or, you know, that approach? Okay, so this is um, automatically we have to come to the agreement. We have to all come to the table and agree to the fact that education is too expensive, especially for the value of the degree that many of us are getting. And I know a lot of people will say that, well, you know, you got people that go to college and they get, um, you know, art degrees and degrees that they like to say that don't have value. And I honestly feel like um, that's not fair because everyone has a right. I feel like everyone should have a right to education. Everyone should be able to access um, 
how whatever quality of education they need to receive to be better people in life. Now, I also understand that we live in a um, capitalistic society in which um, people can offer can offer you the type of education you want, tailor it to you, but you have to pay some money for it. And that's I think that's OK. But I think that um, people should be able to just have the access or have the equal opportunity to obtain um, the level of education they want the, the best way. If that, like, I feel that um, if that includes, excuse me, a voucher or, um, you know, towards a free education for lower income communities, that's, that's cool with me. I just think that the access should be there, but we accept, we have to substantially drive down the cost of education in this country because the, um, the return on it has not been um, what it needs to be for um, people to, to benefit from it. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. It does. And I, I hate to, I hate to put you on the hot seat for all these controversial things, but, uh, okay. you know, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let me ask, what's your take on um, unions? You know, some people argue that teachers unions are um, there to advocate for the rights of teachers to make sure that they, they have a fair shake and that they can negotiate uh, in a, in a competitive way with uh, schools other people argue that, uh, well, you know, the unions also are inhibitors to innovation and change and trying new things. Um, you have you probably have experience as a teacher. Like, what, what are your thoughts on I think, that? I think unions are important, um, un but unions are important far more um, for more than the, the financial part. It's more so for the general welfare of the teachers because um, we unfortunately live in a time where. Um, I feel like students have so much so much power than when I grew up or probably when you grew up. Like there's no 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 means of discipline. And I think that um in a time and era where we we attempt to be more politically correct, we remove some of the accountability that's needed in a lot of situations. And I've seen this as a teacher. So I think that the unions are important because it protects a teacher because oftentimes, and I've heard and I have I've like seen situations where um, a teacher will get in a situation with an unruly student mm -hmm. and um, unruly parents. And essentially it's going to be their word versus the teacher. And that's not fair, you know, because there, there isn't any way or any, um, I would say, uh, yeah, there isn't any way that, um, you know, teachers could, have control of a situation because anytime something occurs, they're going to always listen to the student first with all, you know, all of these things, wild, crazy things that have been happening where, you know, teachers have been molesting kids and things of that nature. And of course, you want to protect the child, you want to protect the family of the child, but oftentimes that, that, that leaves the teachers out to dry. And that's why I'm big and I think unions are important, Just but just not with, with teachers. Unions are important with any type of um, occupation, I feel like, because the workers, the workers are what drives the business. And as much as you want to protect the business, you have to protect the workers. And if our children are going to be the future of America and we want to look after them the best way we know how to, you have to um, ensure that, you know, the, the, those, the men and women that teach them, make sure that they're taken care of as well. And that's why I'm like, not, I hate to be sound biased because I'm a teacher, but that's why I definitely will want to work on um, finding some type of way teachers uh, salary can go up because it because I don't think people or maybe people have gotten um, insight in not going to work and being with their kids on a day to day basis of how it is to be a teacher on a day to day basis. But imagine, you know, you just have your one or maybe four, two, one to four kids. But imagine like 30 or 35 kids in one classroom and you don't necessarily have the support that you have that you need. And that's mainly in specific areas. But we're not against that. But, yeah, I think it's important. What do you think uh, folks in Congress today, what, what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions they have about teachers and, and how to make schools work uh, better for, for communities? I honestly think that they have a false idea of um, equity and access. I think that I think I think that they feel that probably because of, you know, public school is public school and everybody has access to it, then automatically the quality is going to be the same across the board. And that's not the case at all. 
as I stated, you know, you go in like different areas, um, the kids have access to different things. And I think that um, mainly our leaders on Capitol Hill haven't had the opportunity to actually come back down to earth, I feel, because they have a, um, a distorted view on what actually takes place in areas within this nation, or maybe they just don't have any idea at all. But I just think that they're not aware, like they're not with the times. So we can we can say that, you know. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, and in this current day and age where everybody's uh, locked down, I'm guessing in Georgia, the schools are are still closed. Right. Or no? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. We're, um, I think we're, we're basically done. My county is done for the year. Yeah. So did you guys try any of the distance learning, the kind of online learning yeah. stuff? With yes, 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 yes. Basically. Um, um, like you had assignments online, you had ways where the student could contact you if they needed to. Um, you know, like I think that we're probably about to move forward where um, a lot of school may be online. I think that that's what uh, this virus has taught us of just how mobile education could be. Yeah, and do you think that's a good thing, or what? What do you think? What's your view on kind of the uh, online learning? I think it's a necessary thing. I don't want to say good or bad. I think it's a necessary thing and it would um, allow for a more efficient learning process. In some, in some cases, uh, more one-on-one -on -one learning experience for the, the teacher and the student. But I think that there is nothing like um, being in a classroom, being in person. Like I don't want us to ever forget about the feeling of just like vibing with your student, catching the energy of your student or just learning, um, you know, the traits of your student, because those are very important. That that um, social interaction, that person to person interaction, I think that's very important. And I don't want to get away from that. But I also would be remiss if I didn't say that um, technology should be implemented within the learning process as well. Got it. You know, one of the things that comes up with a lot of candidates running for Congress is there's of course the policy. Um, but with a, uh, you know, folks on this show, a lot of folks are kind of uh, similar in that we're all kind of pushing for things that um, were pretty prominent in the Yang campaign. Obviously I, I know you're, you're putting, adapting it for your vision and for your district and you have uh, new ideas as well, but could you share a little bit more Barrington about um your values, like what what are values that are really important to you that you think um, define who you are as a person? Oh man, I, 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 Tom, thank you for asking. I love questions like this. You know, <laughs> I love questions like this. Um, well, first, I think family is important. I think that um, in during my tenure of Congress, I would love to implement many things that restore. Um, America's values and family and understanding like how important values are, I'm oh, sorry, family is um, in building communities because communities build great nations. And I think that's very vital. Uh, I think love is important. I'm a, I feel like I'm a purveyor of love. Like uh, my family has, has always given me the love and the support that I've needed to succeed. And I think that that's one of the things that is missing on a, on a global scale, if I can say that, um, we have to, you know, we have to really, or I feel like at least one of the biggest things that I've learned through this entire pandemic is that um, people are struggling and all of us are struggling in some form or fashion. And we have to possess, again, the words comes up again, the necessary empathy and compassion for each other um, in order for us to move forward in life. So love, family, um, honesty. I think honesty is very important. I think that um, we live in a times where there, we're, we have so much access to information that it's hard to decipher between what's real and what's fake. We live in a time where um, our government has the right to, um, you know, con like control the messaging and not necessarily be honest with the people. And I think that honesty is something important that also needs to be implemented within our political system and implemented with our leadership. Because the people deserve transparency, especially when their lives are on the line. So I've always felt, I've always been taught that um, even if you're, you're unable to deal with the harshness of the truth, um, it's important to know the truth itself in its entirety. So I would say honesty, 
family and love are um, a couple of my staple values. Hold on, you still there? And how could you share with us? Yeah, I'm still here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's it's loud. All right. Yeah. So, very. To... Okay. Hopefully, hopefully we'll we'll make it through. A lot of people live streaming now, probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, could you share a little bit about a, an experience, maybe growing up or in your younger adulthood, where the values of empathy or love or family really were kind of galvanized in you? Okay. Um, oh man, where it became a- real. You know? I have a I have a recent I have a recent um oh man I just I just wrote about this on Facebook okay so um last week last week last week is when um I mean let me start with this we, everyone knows at about now about the Ahmad Arbery case mm-hmm. right and so um I was talking to my best friend because I was saying that how it's so easy for us to take. Well, first of all, we take love, the love of our, the people that love us for granted. And we take moments for granted as well. And I was saying this because um, last week I went to the mountains for a day trip. And in that time, my phone was, my phone was dead. I had no service. And so when I got back in the city, um, I got, I had like probably between um, 41 missed calls, like 21 text messages and voicemails dispersed between members of my family. And my mother was extremely upset. Um, Shout out to my mom, I love my mom, my mom's the best. My mother was extremely upset. My dad was extremely upset. And my thing was, I was like, why are you guys freaking out? Like I'm I'm alive and I'm well. And the reason I brought up Ahmaud Arbery is because what, what, how this connected or what connected with me is that when he went out jogging that day, his mom, when he told his mom, I'm going out jogging, they didn't think that nothing was going to happen. His mother thought that he was going to come back home. And it was probably not until the nighttime she started to worry. And, this, and then you can't imagine the emotion that overwhelmed her body when the coroner called her and told her that she had to go down and uh, identify her son. And I, and I thought about that. And I'm like, damn, I really took the love of my family the empathy and the compassion that they have for me for granted because I was just going for a couple of hours and like my parents and everyone else was so worried, so worried that something happened to me. And I'm just like, I'm okay. But imagine if something did happen to me. Imagine if I didn't come home, you know, and it's little things like that, that we take for granted and that we don't realize how, it's just precious our time is with our loved ones and for us, the importance for us to have that empathy and compassion for each other. And I just was, I was just really taken back. Like, dang, I got like that, that really, that really, really struck a chord with me. And it made me realize that I should be thankful that I have the people in, in my life that care about me and things of that nature. And, and, you know, that worry about me because once again, you never know if you're going to make it back home. Just like, Ahmad Aubrey went out for a jog and didn't make it back home, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, anyone who watches that video or reads about that is um, certainly, like, just shocked. Um, let me ask you this, Barrington. If we want to really uh, uh, peel this onion a little bit, uh-huh. There's uh there's I was reading on Twitter like the battle there's a debate going on on that whole case right and there's uh one ar- one side that's saying oh you know he wasn't jogging there was burglaries all the time blah 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 I don't know any I don't know what who's telling the truth but I'm just I guess I would zoom out and say what how can we show empathy for these folks who feels like they have to shoot someone like what what is going on there like how, they're not like born evil. Like uh, oh, I'm just going to go kill a bunch of people. Right. Obviously, this father and son duo um, felt very strongly that this was a good decision. And rather than um, just kind of locking them up and throwing the key away, I, I'm kind of curious. Like, what is going on? Like, what is the root cause of why what would possess someone to to do such a thing? And I was kind of curious. 
how you how you might try and empathize with um, the the other side of the the coin here. Honestly, Tom, I think that um, in cases like that, um, it's it's difficult. It's complicated in that in those cases because I feel like people who possess those mindsets automatically uh, derive it from ideologies that were passed down from generation. And I think you, it may be hard to reason with those that like in that nature of, of that nature, excuse me. And I think that, um, I don't want to say that you have to understand um, their perspective because their perspective is their perspective, but also their perspective is hurtful um, to the masses at large. So I only could hope that um, with those type of people, you're able to inspire them to see a different perspective out their own. Because I feel that essentially, and I've stated this time and time again, that um, a lot of the American jurisprudence system and American society itself is embedded within racism. And oftentimes, even if you're not a racist person, it's very easy to take a blind eye to things that isn't at your front door, so to speak, that you don't have to deal with. And so I think that it's important um, for these stories to get out or for um, you know, the perspective, the perspectives of victims to be understood by the masses at large, because that's the only way we're going to be able to have compassion and empathy for each other. Like we have to understand that, you know, there is one truth is that we are all trying to get by. We're all trying to live to the best of our abilities. And we also, we feel, we hurt, we all of that. And once we can understand those two things, we should be able to open ourselves up to understand the perspectives of others, to understand the, the pains, the hurts and the struggles of others to produce solutions that will be that will benefit not just one population, but the masses in general. We started this conversation talking about how you're running in a primary against um, John Lewis, a very um, legendary figure right right and it's amazing that here we are in 2020 and we're reading a story about potentially a guy that was out jogging and he got shot by two people or one person but with another person right next to him also uh, armed and i i'm curious like what is your vision for civil rights and kind of healing this racial divide in in our country for the next 50 years because we're clearly not done the right. wounds they're still they still run deep certainly in some parts of the country i i mean i grew up in the northeast and the north and have lived in the northwest so i've not lived in the south but it definitely seems like a different um different sense, set of values for for certain groups down there right and uh, it's amazing because I remember when Obama got elected, I thought, oh, we're post post racial, but we're not. Right. <laughs> like, absolutely, absolutely not. Absolutely what's your take, not. man? Like, how, where do we go from here? It seems so crazy. I think, Tom, we have to have the necessary conversations that need to be had that have been swept under the rug for so long. I think that um, for 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 years now, for generations, even all we've done is metaphorically place a small band-aid on a gunshot wound, expecting just just to expect the bleeding to stop instead of just removing the gun um, from the hand of you know the aggressor. I think that we need to start having those um, those necessary conversations, and we need to start being honest about race relations within this country. It's it's very important. Like it makes you wonder that essentially that if the work of someone as esteemed as Congressman Lewis, um, you know, like what have we as a society, how have we received the work that he's done? I mean, we've made some strides, but um, have we made the necessary strides we need to go forward, you know? So I think if the first thing we need to do is have these conversations and then, um, in, like implementing the necessary solutions. We need to uproot entire, the entire criminal justice system, you know, um, like distinguish um, the distinct problems um, from, you know, these Band-Aid solutions that we've been giving in regards to that for the last 
a century or so. You know, we need to understand and take into account that uh, poverty and classism is one of the biggest um, issues that give away to all of these other problems. Not to discount the issues of race, because I think there's a two pronged issue in our country and it's dealing with class and it's dealing with race. But I think that they're so intertwined and, um, you know, intersected with one another. You have to peel back the layers to totally get to the very bottom of everything, you know? So I feel that once we address the, the and once we are, we are honest and have the necessary conversations, we have to start, you know, providing the solutions to attack classism in our country and to attack um, the criminal justice system that has given way to so many um, racist outcomes. Yeah, it's, uh, I totally agree with you that their race is clearly a complicated, highly charged thing. I would not be surprised if uh, the shooter and his family uh, might also have economic challenges. I don't know, but um, I mean, you can't count it out. You know, yeah. like, you know, it's, it's so many, it's so many problems. Like, and I just feel like, you know, in my in my opinion, and I hate to make pre pre judgments before all the information getting out, but just taking the aesthetic from what I've seen from the video, they were looking for trouble, and. Mm. It's sad that in 2020, like outside of, you know, the city or liberal areas, you still have, you know, these archaic racist ideologies that continue to be permitted. And even um, with the DA um, doing what he did, you know, and not arresting them and the fact that they didn't get arrested until May when this happened in February, that should let you know um, how it is, you know, in these towns that still possess these, you know, prehistoric mindsets in as far as race relation goes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is it true? I think either the father and his son used as an ex police officer or was involved father, with law? The father was involved with law, law enforcement in the town, I believe. Yeah. And they protect their own. And the, see, it's, it's, you see what I'm saying? So many problems that, you know, you have to speak about. And, you know, I've seen people who were, um, requesting that the DA and I forget the two other people resign. And I'm like, no, they should. No, 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 no. We're not going to settle for them to resign. True justice is them being held accountable for violating their oath of office. No, they, they need, they deserve jail time. That's destruction of justice as well. You know? So let's not, and that's, that's another thing too. And that's, that's how we're going to combat this problem. We're going to call out and call, call out the honesty and call out the problems when we see it. Instead of turning a blind eye to it just because we feel that, you know, it has nothing to do with us or it hasn't affected us directly. We have to do that. So let's say you're in uh, in Congress and this happens again or we're still talking about this. What can what can a U.S. congressman do to advance the cause here? In that case, if it happened again and, and I'm in Congress, um, I would I would uh, look into all the, um, you know, historical um, data that's available on uh, racial relations in our nation. And I would possibly suggest that uh, black Americans become a protected class citizen um, on the strength of um, preserving black life and the, and the basis that um the statistics and the studies show that, um, you know, specific prejudices and um, racial ideologies con have continued to persist and continue to persist, which allow um, the blacks to be in the current situation they're in, in regards to um, poverty, in regards to the gender, I'm sorry, the, um, not gender, but um, the wealth gap, <laughs> the wealth mm -hmm. gap and um, things of that nature, excuse me. That's what I would do. I would, I would, I would um, probably pull, pull that out to Congress and we would have to have the conversation about it because it's so many historical accounts that shows that, you know, um, blacks have, um, you know, been on the, on the poor end of the stick. I hate to say it. And in turn, I would basically show that we cannot move forward as a nation and guarantee liberty, freedom, and equality and equity for everyone until we actually come to the table and be honest about this specific um, ordeal. That's why don't, do. Yeah, why don't you think um, we talk about this more? 
It hasn't, and it is not just the Republicans. Like the the, the race relations and the sort of black experience in America was not a hot topic in the primaries. That's because because um, I don't know why I don't know why we don't talk about it more. But um, to answer that, I can only speculate. In my mind, just like for example, when you look at the numbers in Georgia, a lot of um, a lot of um, black people were dying. I think it's believe eighty percent of the fatality cases of coronavirus were blacks, right? Mm. However, our governor just goes goes ahead and opens up the state, and it's like when you do things like that, what message are you sending? Because I I don't I don't want to speculate. I want to know like how do you, like what are you doing? Because when you as a regular civilian, I have access to this information from Googling it. So I know you have access to this information. And when you like do things like that, or when our government does things like that, it's really hard to assess what what are they trying to say um, subconsciously to the populace at large, you know? Um, and oftentimes, once again, because you know, a lot of America don't necessarily deal with the same problems of black people, it's not a hot topic. You know, mm. it's, it's, it's the truth of the matter. And this is why it's important, you know, for everyone, not just, you know, whites or anyone or any other race, but it's important for everyone to call out any type of wrongdoings to anyone else. You know, we have to be accountable to, to each other in that regard. Yeah, you know, it's interesting um, because of this coronavirus thing, there has been also like a little bit of a surge in uh, some hate crimes and uh, animosity against people of uh, Asian kind of origins that That's are American. I hate it. You know, and then you uh, you also see some a little spike in, not a little, but a pronounced spike in anti-Semitism in just in general over the last few years. Right. Uh, you know, it seems like every group uh, has has kind of tries to to stand up for the, themselves, but, but I also don't feel like there's a a big enough coalition of of, of people who have shared experience. Right? Like in some ways, uh, you know, people from, of an Asian origin, like they, I had literally heard. Cases where friends of mine were like, oh, I was walking down the street. People saw me and crossed to the other side because you wow. had black hair, you know, and, and uh, you can't look like you came from Wuhan or whatever. Right. That's crazy. And I was like, you know, that, that, that happens to a lot of groups. Right. Obviously, right. I don't need to, to tell you. So I'm curious, like, how do you think we can all work together more? Because no one benefits from these kind of terrible generalizations. And it it's it it kind of makes it hard for us as a country to to be a melting pot pot and to work together. Um, but it seems like everybody's on their own team and their own tribe. And uh, how how would you try and what's your take on that? And what do you think we should try and do about it? Um, well, Tom, I think that we have to enter into a social contract with each other on all levels, and we have to state that on a very basis. Um, you know, we are all going through the same problems and that for so long we have allowed things like beliefs and like politics to divide us when it shouldn't divide us at the end of the day, because we all have the common goal to live a positive and a successful life for ourselves, each other and our families. So I, I think that it is very important that, you know, we, you know, remove ourselves from the labels that divide us. And we come to the bargaining table and we come to some agreement amongst each other that we deserve better from our, for ourselves. We deserve better for each other and we deserve a better government. That's what I think. And I think that when we when we come together and we realize that we are not each other's enemies and in, 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 general, in general, excuse me, that the establishment and by the establishment, I mean the government themselves. I mean everything. I don't mean the typical um, establishment that the Democrats use. And it's funny how I said the Democrats. I'm going to get to that point. Um, basically, I'll say it now. Like, I don't I'm not a big proponent or. I don't, I'm not a big believer in the two-party system. I, th I think that essentially it has divided people more so. It has brought people together. And I think that essentially it does not serve the greater good of America at large because two parties aren't able to um, 
serve all of the, I would say, the political flexibility of everyone in the nation. So that's why I said that, that we have to um, remove these labels that separate us, understand the notion that we're all looking for something better, and then we we must hold our government accountable. We must, you know, say that we need things like term limits and that things, I'm sorry, that uh, leaders shouldn't be career politicians. We must get the money out of politics and a force or, um, you know, state to the government that we won't allow you all to serve the interests of the corporations anymore. You know, we, we have to take back um, our power, but the only way we do that is by coming together. And by coming together, we just have to understand each other better and understand the problems that we're going through together. Yeah. No, I'm glad we were able to get to know you a little bit better, Barrington, on this on this call. Uh, we're a little bit, uh, we're about out of time, but before we wrap up, I just wanted to give you an opportunity. Were there any topics or items that you wanted to hit that we haven't touched on yet but before we uh, say goodbye for, for this interview? Um, not at all, Tom. The only thing I wanted to say was that um, I have the Gimme 5 initiative. You, if you follow my Twitter, my Twitter is at underscore Barrington II, at underscore Barrington the second. I have the Gimme 5 um, Twitter um, initiative that's pinned, that's the top tweet that's pinned on my profile. And so basically what that is, is saying that um, for you to support me, I'm not asking for your money. I don't feel comfortable asking for, for people's money when they're going through a pandemic like this. I want you to keep your some money. By support, I need you to give me five. I need you to send my information out, my Twitter, my Facebook, my website, send it to five people and make sure they send it to a new five people and just keep that going for me. If you believe in me, if you believe in anything that I'm saying, if you believe that we together can create a better future for ourselves and for our children and for our futures. Right on Barrington. Well, uh, speaking of passing uh, the message along, if uh, folks are watching this and, and you like what, uh, what this guy has to say, please uh, like this video, uh, share it out because uh, the more people that can get to know Barrington through these conversations, uh, the better off I think everyone will be. And this is, uh, this is what democracy is all about. So I, I, I take my hat off to you, Barrington, for, for um, you know, uh, running in this race and providing a fresh perspective and a, and a new perspective. Um, and, it, and there could be a time to pass the baton and maybe, maybe this is that time. So yes, hopefully uh, we'll see more of you in the future, sir. Yes, sir. And I'm, I'm, I'm internally grateful, Tom. I really appreciate you, man. I, I love talking to you. We have to do this again. I look forward to it. And with that, we'll say goodbye, nerds. Goodbye, nerds. <laughs> <laughs>